We are talking about childcare business and we are with a consultant of uh, this uh, childcare business uh, in the person of Caroline Popola. Caroline Popola. Okay. So, good morning and welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I understand you're speaking to us from London, UK. Did you jackpot or you're there for business? <laughs> I was born here and um, um, spent nine years of my life in Nigeria. So I went back to Nigeria at the age of seven, came back at 16. And I've been ever since, but I do go back and forth to Nigeria, yes. Um, I mean, even the story of like being here or coming back, um, it, it all boils down to childcare and um, the importance of actually someone believing in you. Um, I failed all of my exams as a child. And to my mom, she just felt like, well, enough is enough. Like, go back to the UK. No one knows me kind of thing. And just go and live your life kind of, you know. And hence the reason she sent me back at six, um, at 16. Mm. So, um, yes. And um, and I, I think I, I tell that story to really lead us nicely into childcare. Because what I do is really working with early years, so children under five. And working with the teachers and school owners to really ensure that they have quality, high standard childcare. And also, it's so important in the sense that they understand every child's way of learning uh, or method of learning. So, as a result, they're able to know if a child's style of learning is not um, a class is not classroom based. You can also learn; they can learn in different ways. So, really, we're here to talk about not just having quality childcare and sustaining your business. But also, how do you really understand the children you're looking after? So that's where we're at today. Yeah. I was glad to hear the Nigerian in you when I asked if you jackpot or you're just there and you understood and laughed. So that, that's good for me. But now let's rewind and start from the basics. What really, when we're talking about childcare business, what are we talking about in simple terms? So when we're talking about childcare business, so in the UK here, we're blessed enough to have 14 branches in the UK, and we started 19 and a half years ago. So obviously, we're talking about sustainability. How do you sustain your childcare business? How do you scale up your childcare business? And how do you sustain it? The way to sustain childcare businesses, which is what we're talking about, is in terms of the quality of the curriculum you're offering, the quality of the education, the standard of the education. But also, in addition to that, What's really helped us here is the quality assurance and the regulatory governance around it or compliances around it. And this is where coming to Africa is thinking, okay, how do we do this? Do we have these regulatory compliances that the people would adhere to? Because only when your the standard of your education is trusted by the community or your stakeholders, that's when you can then think about scaling up your business. So what it, do we have that in place? I know we don't have that in place. Or we have it in place, but not everyone's aware of it. Not everyone knows about it. And that's a real shame. What do we even need to do to tell ourselves that uh, something in the likeness of what should be in place is in place? What does the government or individuals need to do? So, and thank you so much. It really boils down, definitely boils down to the government. There has to be one rule across board that every childcare practitioner is are adhering to and if that's not the case which is where the quality assurance we need to have a governing body in the uk here we have a body called austin that literally regulates all of our childcare settings and a lot of um, um settings are either graded on a good quality or outstanding quality or inadequate and we need to have something like that where there'll be no um, hands-on or someone saying, oh, I'll give you some money to cover up and things like that. So as, as, as a result, we're able to have a really good standard across. And we're thinking about the education of the children. We're thinking, of, think, thinking about their development, the milestone. We're thinking about their tracking, um, if they're meeting their milestones. And these are areas that are really important um, for us to really good, really high, good quality education for children across Africa. Let's draw a, a, a dividing line between this childcare business you're talking about and the child rights. Because uh, in Nigeria, at least a lot of states have uh, implemented the child rights in their states. But what is the max distinction between just talking about child rights and then talking about childcare business? When you're talking, even as practitioners, when you're talking about children's rights, um, as practitioners, we should know that. And we should know that every child has a right 
well, whilst they're with you and obviously when they're with the parents but and you understand your team understand what the rights are um what we call here children's act here so um and that that's just simple democracy really to be honest with you and every child regardless of their age have the right to privacy and so many other things alongside it and it's having ed, um, educators that really understand those rights and adhere to those rights and even educating parents on what those rights are as in like the children have these rights so as a result you can't do a you can't do b you can't do c to the children so it's having to do that and if even regardless of how old they are in their early years because we're talking about under fives here if regardless of how old they are you're even teaching them and then learning those rights even at a childlike language and that's really key that's crucial and this is where those rights regardless of what state or what we, we have in place is taught to the children talk to the parents but we can only teach it as school owners and practitioners if we know what those rights are and i can guarantee you if you are if you take a poll and ask a large number of practitioners and teachers in africa what these rights are in their various states they probably don't even know mm. they probably don't even know wow i'll give you an example we tried to set up a social um a special needs unit which is a unit with children with additional needs or special needs so if a child in um um hearing impaired or vision impaired and things like that and we sat down with a few providers i promise you everyone was doing something totally different the right hand did not know what the left hand was doing and that was so heartbreaking why should we have that when are we going to move away from that we're no longer a third world country i don't refer to us as a third world country we are no longer we're the giants of africa and we need to start behaving like the giants of africa in everything we do hmm. okay now um when you're talking about child care uh what are the targets what is the target when you're talking about child care so when you're talking about the targets there are quite a few things that are really stopping us and and really um so like handicapped us as practitioners or even in and i say a lot more in africa and the first thing which i said originally was the regulatory compliances like if we don't know what one minute the, the government wants us to do this next minute another department of the government wants us to do this we're not sure what to do and there's a lot of money exchanging hands as a result your business is not sustainable the other thing is having to retain quality staff what training do we have in place personal development and so on that do we have in place for those staff because only when you retain good staff you're able to then have consistency with the children and the learning uh, and the teaching method and even what you're teaching as a result you would grow your clientele and your customers will be happy so those two things are very key and in addition to that, when you retain those good quality staff, they're able to deliver quality um, teaching and learning for the children, having to know every single child individually as opposed to collectively. So those are things that we need to have in place that really, uh, those are a few. I mean, there's so many, but those are a few. And then again, we're talking about funding. What funding is available? What access do we have to, to, to um, resources? You've just said earlier at the beginning of this conversation about Japan. Mm -hmm. When you have people Japan, why are they Japan? They Japan because they want the best for their children. They want the best for the next generation of their own of, of, of their own lineage. So as a result, what are we doing to retain these people from leaving? You know, so all of those things need to be put. There's a lot of conversation that needs to be had, but we need to start from somewhere um, because we can't all give up. We can't all give up. We need to start from someone. Someone needs to start to listen to the to, to the practitioners and the teachers. And I hear as well that teaching and um, teaching in, in I don't want to say Nigeria, but really in Nigeria, from my experience in the last three years, is because they haven't got any other job to go to. Teaching should be about passion. Should be about the fact that you want to be there, not because you don't have any other job to go to. That's so sad. Mm. Yeah. Well, you said uh, one of the key factors is to never give up. Uh, that means you must have faced some challenges and have been able to surmount them, maybe m most of them. So what are some of these challenges if you might want to share with us? I mean, even, and, and thank you for that, even for us in the UK, the challenges are number one in terms of funding. I mean, there's never enough funding because you know, especially with the, world, the way the world is at the moment, where um, 
things are so difficult and finances and so on. So it just means both parents in the UK now have to go back to work. And if they do go back to work, that means the earning power. So, for example, their earning power has to be high for them to be able to pay their childcare fee or school fees and things like that. So you can imagine that a country like the UK, if, there's, if the government's really helping out to try and get some funding in, and we have Africa where there's no money whatsoever. So I could imagine the sheer volume of challenge that practitioners are facing. And then the Bijapa syndrome it just means one minute you open your school with maybe 200 children, and before you know it, 50 of those children are Bijapa. What do you then do? So funding is really key. Those are the number one challenges that we face. And I think I overheard you when we were talking about um, about uh, minimum wage and things like that. And it's so important for you to retain good teachers and good staff. You need to pay them. Your environment has to be competitive. They have to be competitive benefits. And that's the only way you can really retain these people to want to stay with you. So there's lots and lots of challenges. Um, but it's the fact that we need to come to the table and really sit down and start to address those challenges. That is the key. As opposed to not talking about it at all. And like they say, sweeping under the carpet. It's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. Who do you think should drive this process, uh, you know, if, if we want to have it effectively, especially uh, here in Nigeria, who should drive the pro process? Is it the government or private individuals? So the government, it's crucial that the government be a part of this. And it's only then that the government can then see who are the practitioners or private individuals that are into education and passionate about education that really want to see a change by, my, by, by shouting for a change. What we tend to do is we collaborate with us, even though we're based in the UK. In my three years or two, two and a half years of being in Nigeria and putting up a, a program, um, we have a program on the 13th of July, um, the Early Years Child Care Conference, um, where we get lots of practitioners, teachers, and school owners together, and we really talk about good practice, and we talk about safeguarding children and all of that. So for the government, for this to be effective, the government needs to not just talk to, uh, not just think of what they want to do, but also get a collaboration, work in collaboration with practitioners and people that are looking to make a change within education for the country, that there are no selfish, selfish motive. This is not about being selfish. This is about wanting the next generation to be better and wanting education in Africa to be better. So it starts with the government. And it cascade down, we work in a collaboration with all other good practitioners that really want a change. So what's the lowest hanging fruit that they need to start with before they can uh, get the people, uh, the right people to do the right thing? What, what are some of the things that we need to put in place immediately to make sure that this kicks up? Let's get to the table. There's so many incredible practitioners in, your, in Nigeria, especially that I've met and I've worked with. These people are screaming, they want the best, they want better. The government have access to these, these data. They can get these people to the table and let's start to listen. Let's start to listen. We've got to start from somewhere. So the lowest hanging fruit is collaborating and seeing what practitioners are doing well that we need to sit down and talk to. Doing well as in doing well for them. Doing well as in like speaking out loud, really, shouting out loud. Not doing well in terms of their business, but shouting out loud that wants to change. Okay. And we have the Ministry of Education. I know we have so many other people on board the Ministry of Education, but when you have someone that doesn't have a clue about education and you're having them as the lead, that's a bit challenging because what are they coming to teach the rest of us? Mm, that's that's weighty. <laughs> that's really weighty. I don't know how that's going to be. A lot of things here in Nigeria are tied to politics and all that, and we don't find uh, these individual voices uh, crying in the wilderness, as it were, that we can hear them so much. And then, um, but you've been here for like three years, four years. Um, what are the peculiar things about Nigeria that you'd like changed? Because my passion is always education, and I talk about this, I can stand on the rooftop and talk about child care, like, till the kingdom come. So for me, it's like, what can we do differently? And also, there's so many children that haven't even got that lead to education. I think, like I, I said in one of the programs last week, is like Nancy Mandela that said that education is the best thing you can do to, you can give to any world. Whilst there's various ways in which we learn, 
is having to understand how do we individually learn and what can we do to even get those children off the street because if we don't get them off the street you get the girls going into prostitution you get the boys going into arm robbery and things like that when is that going to change we need to do something now we need to do something now to make that change and the change starts with us hmm. so while we wait for the government to do the needful which may not come in a very long time what advice would you have for the practitioners who are already in the business of the things that they need to do that will take them to a, a different level we need to collaborate we need to come together listen to each other's voices and see what changes can we make how can we start to implement these changes but we need to come together there's nothing wrong in collaborating it's just incredible because with collaboration you immediately the things the government are failing to do you start to do them collaboratively together as as a group you can we can form up our own quality assurance group and we start to bring out those things that those changes we start to bring those changes and eventually hopefully for a good government they start to listen mm. and i i really emphasize the word good for a good government they start to listen mm. so it's the listening because we can there's so many practitioners that do great things in nigeria and across the Af across africa but they're not being listened to and they would have pushed and pushed and pushed the bar and they got fed up of doing it and then it becomes oh i'll just sit by myself and i just do my little thing in my little corner but that's not going to change it's like taking a bucket to the to the to the seaside and using a tap to to pour water into the seats there's not going to be an, it's not going to be effective but collaboration together we can do great things together we can go far and also what is wrong with the government in having to see other countries where these education system the education system is working and go and see how that's been done and effectively and then bring that back to want to make a change because we definitely know it's not working but there are countries where it's working so why don't we go that's the whole point of our mentorship that's the whole point of our watching what other people are doing and see what works take out take out the good part the good practices that works and bring that back and effect that in your country that's another thing we could do yeah well let's hope that we'll get to that el dorado because now that is what it sounds like and we do hope that our leaders will have the conscience to do the needful it's not that they don't know these things they know it a lot of them have their kids outside the country studying they know what quality of education they get they, a lot of them visit these children and go for vacations they know how things are working and we keep asking the same question why are they not implementing the same things here and making our country the true giant that it should be in Africa. But well, let's hope and pray. We like praying in Nigeria. So let's hope and pray uh, that the needful will be done. And one day, that leader with a conscience will come up on board and make things change for the better. But for today, we'd like to thank you for your time on our show this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. You too. We've been talking with Caroline uh, Popola, uh, a child, um, an expert in the field of uh, building sustainable childcare business. And uh, we were talking about what needs to be done in Nigeria as a country and how needful this is uh, for the development of our country. Uh, this is where eventually we'll wrap up the show for this morning. We'd like to thank you for your time staying there and watching us on the program this morning. Let's do it again tomorrow. And until then, my name is Nyam Gul Agaji. Bye for now. <laughs>